Family Values Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is the second part of Chapter 4. Home Ownership, Normativity, and the New Deal. The government promotion of consumer credit has long played a unique role in America's public, private welfare state. Standing alongside social insurance is one of the key redistributive mechanisms developed under the New Deal. Federal policymakers from the mid-20th century onward have made strategic use of private credit markets to fulfill the so-called American dream of middle-class home ownership, inventing various kinds of administrative and legal guarantees to ensure that credit would be readily available to the suitably qualified borrower. These initiatives date back to the Great Depression, when President Frank Franklin D. Roosevelt created a host of new federal institutions designed to protect borrowers from the risk of imminent foreclosure. The Federal Housing Administration, FHA, created in 1934, encouraged banks to lend qualified borrowers at low interest rates by insuring them against the risk of default, while the Federal National Mortgage Association, FNMA, or Fannie Mae, established in 1938, helped to relieve banks of long-term liquidity risk by buying up their mortgage portfolios and selling them on to investors. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, created in 1933, played an equally important role in facilitating consumer credit markets by inventing a new and safer form of mortgage contract the long-term fixed-rate amortized loan, the so-called vanilla mortgage, as a replacement for the short-term interest-only mortgages that had hitherto dominated the market. Together, these initiatives allowed banks to expand their mortgage portfolios and lend at low interest rates without incurring substantial financial risk. The expansion of these New Deal housing programs after World War II Led to a, a led to a dramatic increase in home ownership rates, from forty four percent of male headed families in nineteen thirty four to sixty three percent in nineteen seventy two. By opening up mortgage insurance to unionized industrial workers, federal housing policies swelled the ranks of the American middle class, and established suburban home ownership as a new middle class idea. Yet. Housing credit was always premised on the sexual and racial normativities of the Fordist family wage, which defined credit worthiness as a function of employment and marital status, and therefore ended up favoring a standard white male worker over all other subject classes. The FHA imposed strict underwriting criteria on lenders, dictating everything from the acceptable payment structure of mortgages to housing models location, and borrower profile, and banks needed to conform to these guidelines if they wished to receive federal guarantees. Ultimately, it was the FHA that decided who was creditworthy enough to receive a low-interest mortgage. The overall effect of such oversight was to restrict mortgage finance to the married white man and to exclude Ford Fordism's non-normative subjects, from the forms of wealth accumulation that flowed from home ownership in the post-war era. The very structure of the 30-year vanilla mortgage was closely modeled on the working life of the unionized industrial worker, making it almost impossible for non-standard workers to gain access to housing credit, even in the absence of overt discrimination. The fact that unionized Fordist workers were also covered by generous forms of social insurance from work-based health care to workers' compensation and unemployment coverage, made them doubly attractive to, to federal insurers. Not only were they locked into long-term employment contracts, but they also had guaranteed wages and were therefore at very low risk of default. Borrowers who could not demonstrate such a stable attachment to the workplace were simply not able to qualify for a state-insured low-interest mortgage, effectively excluding most African Americans and women of all races from the private housing market.
In the case of African Americans, these employment-based exclusions were exacerbated by the residential preferences of federal housing authorities, which consistently favored suburban single-family homes over downtown tenements. As white married families began their long post-war exodus to the suburban hinterlands, African Americans were left behind in increasingly impoverished inner cities. Those who may have wanted to purchase in the city center were further penalized by the HOLC's system of urban risk taking or risk rating, which routinely assigned the color red for uninsurable to the inner city ghettos, hence the term redlining, and in the process made them especially vulnerable to the machinations of local slumlords. Thus, a series of seemingly innocuous bureaucratic choices, from urban risk ratings to insurable housing models, had a profound effect on the post-war landscape, largely confining African Americans to high-rent tenements in dilapidated inner cities, while white Americans proceeded to accumulate state-insured housing, housing wealth in the suburbs. Ira Katznelson aptly refers to federal housing policy in this era as a form of affirmative action for whites. Others refer to a hidden welfare state that allowed whites to accumulate what looked like private wealth, but was in fact an alternative form of asset-based welfare multiply subsidized or multiply subsidized by federal, federal guarantees, public insurance, and tax concessions. Federal housing policies, moreover, were not simply racializing, but also tightly bound up with the normative regulation of gender and sexuality. The historian Clayton Howard has recently explored in some detail just how central these criteria were to the development of the post-war housing market. Well into the 1960s, FHA guidelines instructed banks to check a borrower's character before issuing a loan and specifically identified marital status as a litmus test for creditworthiness. The 1952 edition of the FHA's underwriting manual counseled lenders. The mortgager, the mortgager who is married and has a family generally evidences more stability than a mortgager who is single because, among other things, he has responsibilities holding him to his obligations. Elsewhere in the manual, banks were advised not to issue loans to people unrelated by blood, since the probabilities of dissatisfaction between members of the partnership are strong and seriously affect the desire for continuing ownership on the part of any one of the principals. In an era where marriage was difficult to dissolve and no-fault divorce was still far off on the horizon, the marital contract between a working man and his wife appeared to offer the same prospect of reliability as the long-term contract of employment. A white man tied to the responsibilities of work and family was considered the most creditworthy of borrowers and the most insurable of risks. A single white man might have enjoyed more financial independence but was less likely to respect his long-term obligations. A single working woman was an uncertain credit risk at best while a married woman was in general barred from receiving any form of consumer credit in her own name. The standardization of consumer risk profiles relegated borrowers to a continuum of more or less insurable risks. With women, homosexuals, and the non-white defined as outliers on the bell curve of credit risks. This premium placed on marital status within FHA lending criteria was supplemented by more overt forms of exclusion directed toward homosexuals. In the years immediately following World War II, political homophobia increased significantly as many states introduced new criminal penalties for non-heterosexual sex and stepped up, and stepped up their efforts to police and punish practicing homosexuals. FHA guidelines reflected this newly punitive environment by instructing lenders not to issue mortgages to people who had been convicted of sex-related offenses, including lewd vagrancy or military discharge, automatically marginalizing many homosexual men who might have otherwise qualified. <laughs>
These policies were quickly impacted on the demographic profile of different neighborhoods, as census data reported a clear increase in married couples residing in outer suburban postcodes and a corresponding rise in unmarried single residents in the inner cities. In Howard's words, post-war housing policies erected a social and spatial closet around normative heterosexuality, creating suburban spaces in which homosexuality could only be lived in secret, and by the same token, urban spaces in which single homosexual whites congregated as an increasingly distinct social demographic alongside the non-white poor. Howard speaks in this regard of parallel racial and sexual hierarchies operating in the post-war housing market. By encouraging normative sexuality through mortgage regulation and by spurring the outward migration of married couples, the state facilitated the meeting of different groups of people in areas defined by marital status. This process never operated with the rigidity of racial segregation since gay residents have always lived in the suburbs and many married residents continued continued to live in urban areas. Yet by the mid-1960s, the newest suburbs and oldest cities boasted unprecedented concentrations of residents divided by marital status and newly built institutions like bars or churches that cater to different sexual communities. Depending on one's subject position, the hierarchies of the Fordist family wage could be seen as existing separately and side by side, creating strange urban proximities between sexual and racial outsiders. Or in the case of those who were both non-white and non-heterosexual, could intersect in the one person to create a concentration of uninsured risks. The normative restrictions on consumer and housing credit persisted well into the 1960s, when they came under increasing attack from feminists, the civil rights movement, and gay liberation activists. Over the following years, Congress passed a series of laws prescribing discrimination in consumer credit markets. The Fair Housing Act of 1968, followed by the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, extended racial anti-discrimination laws to housing and consumer credit markets, respectively. These were followed by the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, HMDA of 1975, and the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, of 1977, which explicitly outlawed redlining and introduced systematic procedures for monitoring the demographic distribution of bank loans. Regulation B of the 1974 Equal Credit Opportunity Act enabled married women to obtain full access to consumer credit in their own names. Only gay men who had also protested their exclusion from mortgage finance were not accorded any formal protection from bias in lending in this era. In any event, these formal measures were only ever partially successful in redressing some of the normative exclusions of the Fortis credit regime. After all, no anti-discrimination law could reverse the fact that African Americans, Latinos, and women of all ethnicities were overrepresented among the ranks of the uninsured and precariously employed, classified as non-conforming by virtue of their distribution in the labor market, rather than any personal prejudice on the part of bank managers. Accordingly, the distribution of credit remained trapped in the normative limits of the family wage, long after formal discrimination had been outlawed. When credit was finally democratized, then it was not primarily as a result of anti-discrimination laws, but rather thanks to the market-driven liberalization of consumer credit that began in the mid-1990s and accelerated thereafter. Democratizing um, Credit Beyond the Norm The American mortgage market underwent a series of dramatic and highly consequential transformations in the decades preceding this, the subprime crisis. Throughout the 1970s, the government-sponsored entities Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac perfected a newer, more sophisticated method for helping banks to offload and sell on their loan portfolios. No longer did they simply purchase these loans and sell them on as is. They now repackaged and sold them on to investors as blended risk rated financial instruments known as mortgage-backed securities or MBS. MBS. 
By the end of the 1970s, lenders had largely abandoned the marital status-based criteria that informed lending decisions in the past and broadened their criteria for acceptable employment status. In an era where long-term employment contracts were becoming rare and marriage could be dissolved by no-fault divorce, it no longer made sense to base credit decisions on these considerations alone. Increasingly in this period, bank lenders began to use more granular risk-based metrics to assess the creditworthiness of borrowers, basing their decisions on evolving credit scores rather than, than the status-like classifications of marriage and employment. Yet, for the most part, government-insured lending remained cautious, privileging standard or vanilla mortgage products in customers with minimal default risk, with the predictable result that mortgage decisions tended to marginalize minorities. Here again, the lending decisions of banks continued to replicate the normative exclusions of a previous era long after they had abandoned overt forms of discrimination. By the mid-1990s, however, private lenders were entering the market en masse and in a context of rising investor demand for MBSs, were increasingly willing to extend credit to those with riskier borrower profiles. Martha Poon notes, that this new generation of non-bank lenders oversaw a gradual shift away from traditional exclusionary practices of credit control by screening and towards by screening and towards grade, gradated practices of credit control by risk. Under control by risk, managerial decision making was no longer confined to approving or withholding loans, but was extended to the exploitation of stabilized grades of credit quality accessed through scores to create multiple borrowing options tailored to accommodate varying levels of risk. The standardization of credit through the general adoption of commercial FICO scores thus created the conditions for a destandardization of credit options, allowing even the most non-conforming of borrowers to be assigned a credit score and priced accordingly. These techniques came into full effect at the height of the housing boom of the early 2000s, as mortgage brokers who had saturated the market for safe borrowers now turned their sights towards non-standard credit risks. If banks had traditionally eschewed the asset poor, the uninsured and the precariously employed private brokers were now scrambling to market credit to both subprime low income and Alt-A credit blemished borrowers safe in the knowledge that the attendant risks could be rapidly secured, securitized and sold on to investors. In this way, the private mortgage sector broke through the normative barriers of the old Fordist credit regime. Well into the 1980s, notes Herman Schwartz, the vanilla loans favored by government-sponsored enterprises continue to operate within an, an actuarial calculus of risk established in the New Deal era. Vanilla MBSs, in many ways, are a classic product of the Bretton Woods or Fordist-era welfare state. They socialize the risks attendant on providing housing finance, implicitly homogenized the returns to investors, favored debtors, and homogenized borrowers to a middle-class family model buying single-family homes. The new generation of private brokers replaced these traditional actuarial models of risk standardization with a much more speculative strategy of risk optimization through diversification into some of the more high-risk segments of the consumer credit market. In practice, such high-risk borrowers were disproportionately to be found among African Americans and Latinos in general. African American and Latino women in general, or in particular, and women of all ethnicity, ethnicities, precisely the, de the demographic that was most likely to have recourse to welfare. For the first time in the long history of American consumer credit, the subprime market allowed unprecedented numbers of margin marginal borrowers, women, African Americans, and Latinos, and non-normative households, single mothers in particular, to aspire to home ownership, although often at an exorbitant price. It was expected that a sizable number of these borrowers would, def would default, perhaps after rescheduling their loans several times. And yet, as long as house prices continue to appreciate 
these higher than average default rates would be more than compensated for by the higher than average returns to be gleaned from rescheduling fees and the punitive conditions of subprime loans. In a certain sense, then, the democratization of credit did appear to resolve the enduring problems of race and gender-based exclusion that had long plagued America's hidden welfare state. For a brief moment, the private sector expansion of credit embraced the non-standard subjects who had once been summarily excluded from the New Deal social consensus, seeming to confirm the notion that financialization would usher in a superior form of social democracy, a social democracy beyond the norm. No longer would the poor need to rely on the degrading crutches of social welfare and income transfers to get by, since they, too, could now participate in forms of asset ownership once reserved for white married men and their families. Ultimately, what Clinton held out to minorities was a conduit into the avenues of private wealth accumulation long considered a privilege of the white middle class. The dividing line between America's hidden and overt welfare state, a line that was crudely exacerbated by the tax revolts of the 1970s, could now be closed as all were shunted into the logic of familial wealth transmission. It is in this specific sense, no doubt, that Clinton's discerned a secret alliance between asset-based welfare and the promotion of family values. But it is here also that we can identify a latent contradiction within the third-way strategy of asset-based welfare. How, after all, is it possible to overcome inequality by democratizing a legal instrument that is intended by its very nature to privatize wealth? Is social democracy achievable through the generalization of inheritance? Arguably, this tension is intrinsic to all forms of social democracy and has been at the heart of debates about the status of inheritance since the great wealth expropriations of the French Revolution and after. By its very nature, social democracy can only ever partially resolve the tension between private wealth and the political ideal of equality. After all, if it were to completely abolish the institution of inheritance, it would become indistinguishable from socialism. At best, then, it can offer panaceas to the problems of maldistribution by seeking to increase earned income, wages, relatively to unearned income, wealth, or by introducing some form of progressive taxation. But the tension becomes extreme in the contemporary policy agenda of asset-based welfare, since the latter sets itself the impossible task of achieving equality through the generalization of inherited wealth. Here we find the perfect expression of capital's countervailing tendencies, as theorized by Marx. The coexistence, that is, of a democratizing impulse that appears to overcome the existing rigidities of inherited status, with an equally forceful trend toward the reinvention of generalization of inheritance itself. Thus, thus, primogenitor and entail were first abolished in the 18th century. In the late 19th century, married women were allowed to inherit property, and in the early 21st century, the rules of inheritance were changed to include same-sex couples and their children. At each conjuncture, the established form of inheritance is dissolved only in order to erect a new, more democratized, but no less implacable form in its place. It is surely no coincidence, after all, that asset-based welfare's most celebrated policy experiment, most celebrated policy experiment, explicitly sought to school the income poor in the art of managing a trust fund. Implemented in the form of pilot programs in the United States, but most comprehensively embraced in Britain under Tony Blair, the Child Trust Fund was designed to extend the benefits of familial asset accumulation to all children. In his public pronouncements on the program, Blair presented the Child Trust Fund as an, in as an initiative to democratize inheritance itself. Overcoming the inequalities of wealth and income that hold people back is one of the greatest challenges facing Britain. We should aspire to be not just a democracy of property owners, but a democracy in which ownership of wealth is open to all.
We are extending to everyone what the affluent take for granted. Our baby bond bestows to each child the advantages that come from reaching adulthood backed by a financial nest egg and extends the saving, savings habit to all. In a similar vein, Bruce Ackerman and Anne Alstott, early proponents of the stakeholder society, hailed the Child Trust Fund as a form of citizen inheritance that would somehow neutralize the inequalities traditionally associated with private wealth accumulation. Young adults get the money regardless of whether their parents are stockbrokers or school teachers, computer geeks or construction workers. All have helped build Britain, and all may rightfully demand that their children share in the wealth they have created. Private inheritance proceeds on a very different premise. Kids get their money on the basis of blood, not effort or common citizenship. Citizen inheritance is not only based on fundamental notions of fairness, it also provides a startup fund to every Briton when he or she is beginning adult life and really needs it. Notwithstanding such grant ambitions, the aim of the Child Trust Fund, according to one commentator, was never that of comprehensive wealth redistribution, but rather the more modest one of fostering a culture of investment, and I would add a specifically familial culture of accumulation among the asset poor. Short of implementing a radical reform of the tax system and a forcible redistribution of wealth, such projects have little chance of achieving the long-term democratic aims they claim to support. Here again, we can point to the inherent contradiction at the heart of third-way asset-based policies. The advocates of asset-based welfare may well proclaim their support for the progressive taxation of inherited wealth, but in practice their adherence to the logic of familial wealth works to undermine any popular investment in such a project. It is this contradiction that has made asset-based welfare so vulnerable to recuperation by the right. Minorities against the, the, the estate tax, democratizing the tax payer revolt. Like so many other third wave strategies, Clinton's project for the democratization of home ownership was something of a double edged sword. After all, it could just as easily lend itself to the cause of Republican populism, with its rousing paranoia and much more radical opposition to redistributive taxes. This was precisely the intuition pursued by George W. Bush, who released his own blueprint for the American dream immediately after his ascension to power in 2001, and subsequently set about marketing the cause of expanding home ownership to traditional Democrat constituencies. Bush pushed the liberalization of credit even further than his predecessor had, approving new legislation that preempted state efforts to regulate private mortgage brokers, the very institutions that were issuing the bulk of subprime loans to non-conforming borrowers. Most felicitous, however, was the fact that Bush's election coincided with the end of the dot-com boom and the transition from one period of asset inflation to another. As stock prices plummeted at the turn of the century, Greenspan sought to preempt a recession by cutting interest rates to historic lows, while investors shifted funds from the Dow Jones into the residential housing market. With its high yield mortgage backed securities and collateralized debt obligations. The progressive and still cautious liberalization of credit that had been initiated by Clinton now gave way to a veritable explosion of exotic and adjustable and adjustable rate mortgages designed to price as many high risk borrowers as possible into the market for consumer credit. And as cheap credit fueled ever expanding house acquisition, House prices embarked on a dramatic upward spiral that seemed to include everyone in its aspirational promise. During his, during his election campaign, Bush's chief strategist, Karl Rove, advised him that the inclusion of minorities in the logic of inheritable wealth, even in the conditional and aspirational form of mortgage debt, would turn at least some traditional Democratic voters into allies of the Republican Party. Nowhere was this intuition borne out more clearly than in the campaign to repeal the estate tax, which by the time of Bush's election in 2001 
had managed to attract a surprising degree of support among minority voters. As far back as the early 1990s, at a time when Clinton was promoting the virtues of asset-based welfare, Republican tax reformers were targeting aspirational homeowners as new recruits in the campaign against the death tax. These campaigners focused their energies on precisely those minorities that were now being actively courted by private mortgage brokers, African Americans and Latinos, single women, gays and lesbians. Delegations were sent to the National Association of Women Business Owners, the National Black Chamber of Commerce, the National Indian Business Association, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce, the Texas Conference of Black Mayors, and various other minority associations in the hope of convincing them that their newly acquired wealth was at risk of, of expropriation by the so-called death tax. By, <coughs> by 2001, Note Michael Greitz and Ian Shapiro, a veritable rainbow coalition of minority groups, were now actively urging repeal. Convinced that their recent and conditional access or ascension sorry, that their recent and conditional ascension to familial wealth was threatened by a tax touching only the wealthiest two percent of households. Arguably, it was this extraordinary wave of popular bipartisan support that enabled Bush to push through with his temporary repeal of the, of the estate tax. Bush's ownership society was almost identical in the details to Clinton-era asset-based welfare, and yet its rhetoric insistently focused on the virtues of inheritance rather than redistribution rendering explicit what remained unsaid and disavowed in Clinton's third-way strategy. The anti-death tax campaign thus caught the Clinton administration off guard when it managed to recruit several members of the Congressional Black Caucus to its cause. When Congressman Sanford Bishop of Georgia spoke in favor of repeal, he used arguments eerily similar to those of the white anti-tax protesters of the 1970s. The death tax represents all that is unfair and unjust about the tax structure in America because it undermines the life work and life savings of Americans who want only to pass along to their children and their grandchildren the fruits of their labor and the realization of the American dream. Even though Republicans refuse to support same-sex marriage, their allies in the tax repeal movement managed to convince an impressive number of gays and lesbians that their newly formed families were unfairly burdened by an estate tax that punished them twice over, once when a first partner died and a second time at the death of the surviving spouse. Because they were unmarried, gays and lesbians were not eligible for the estate tax marital deduction and were therefore penalized for the non-recognition of their relationships. This argument was so successful that by 2001, a full 61% of self-described lesbian and gay Democrat voters declared themselves in favor of estate tax repeal. The success of the Republican campaign against the estate tax suggests that the turning point marked by the late 1970s, when white middle-class owners turned their allegiance away from the welfare state, had now encompassed minority voters too. With their principled support of taxes on inherited wealth, the Ford Foundation proponents of asset-based welfare had grossly, dis had grossly miscalculated the effective valence of private home ownership in a context of diminishing social welfare. As Karl Rove had intuited, the long-term effect of asset-based welfare was not so much to democratize wealth. This it did only temporarily and in the aspirational form of growing household indebtedness but rather to enlist the political sympathies of the asset impoverished on the side of inheritable wealth. That wealth democratization through credit was in the long run an impossible feat was more than confirmed by the subprime crisis of 2007, which generated a net decline in American median wealth. Latino, African-American, and female-headed households in particular experienced dramatic losses of wealth in this period as, as a result of falling house prices. Underwater home loans and foreclosures 
an extraordinary step backward for those who were already among the most asset impoverished. This sudden and brutal negation of the aspirational promise of credit, neoliberalism's only policy response to growing inequality, has palpably reinforced the deep social divisions among Americans in the lingering post-crisis era. Once the mitigating effects of credit expansion were removed, it was inevitable that the actual polarization of American wages and wealth would reassert itself in the crudest of forms. Perhaps in the long run, this crisis will enable a new cross-racial, cross-gendered alliance among America's poor. For the moment, however, it seems to have revived and radicalized the vicious nativism of the white tax revolt in the guise of Donald Trump. Gay Marriage and the Estate Tax If the relationship between neoliberal credit markets, race, and gender has been subject to intense commentary in recent years, the same politics has played out in distinct ways with respect to those who were, also or only, defined by their non-normative sexuality, in large part due to the fact that the non-heterosexual belong to no class, race, or gender in particular, and inhabit all levels of the income and wealth scale. In effect, the political homophobia of the post-war era was remarkable in that it was perhaps the one form of state violence that could seriously disable the privileges of the white male citizen. Aside from a criminal record, white men during this period can only be denied the right to credit and property for one reason, the fact that they were openly homosexual. This exclusion was enforced not only by legal means, for instance, the effective prohibition against lending to known homosexuals that was inscribed in federal housing guidelines, but also and probably more often by family homophobia. Its consequences became frighteningly real at the height of the AIDS crisis, when gay men found themselves defined as uninsurable risks and deprived of health care ousted from homes they had shared with a lover or unable to receive property from a deceased partner. As late as 1997, Judith Butler could plausibly conceptualize gays as lesbians, or end lesbians as a distinct economic class, defined by their simple exclusion from inheritance law and actuarial norms of ins- insurable risk. With hindsight, however, it seems clear that the AIDS crisis also represented a turning point in the historical relationship between gay men and American capital. The invention of antiretrovirals and the subsequent conversion of HIV from a death sentence to chronic illness coincided with a new expansionist moment in the market for consumer credit as investor demand for consumer debt-backed Securities persuaded lenders to aggressively market credit to new and previously untapped niche markets. At the same time that mortgage brokers and other lenders moved down market, then reaching out to the previously unbanked to market payday loans, subprime mortgages, and other forms of non-standard credit, the same class of lenders also moved up market into a high-end niche composed of putatively affluent, risk-taking, yet loyal gay consumers. Beginning in the early 1990s, financial service brokers and consumer lenders embarked on an extraordinary quest to capture the gay market, offering everything from targeted credit cards, specialized mortgage projects, and dedicated legal services in their efforts to lure this elusive and previously invisible demographic. Coming at the end of the acute AIDS crisis of the 1980s, this this exuberant induction into the world of consumer credit appeared to signal the demise of an older, cruder kind of homophobia, one shaped by the normativities of the family wage and its blunt forms of exclusion. Gay men who at the height of the AIDS crisis had been defined as uninsurable were now counted as exceptionally good credit risks and ideal consumers of financial services. Men who had been at risk of eviction in the late 1980s were now celebrated as the agents of gentrification. Others who had seen their wills overridden by family members were courted by legal advisors offering to get their estates in order. Having been shunned for so long, white gay men imagined to be uniformly high-earning, property-owning, and childless were now fetishized as the perfect consumer niche market and taken to represent the gay market itself.
an assumption that was apparently based on the very specific demographics of gay lifestyle magazines and later debunked. Now, market demographics notwithstanding, non-normative sexual practice is clearly not sufficient criterion to constitute a class. Queerness is rather transversal to class, cutting across the stratifications of race and gender and incorporating people from across the income and wealth spectrum. Yet the expansion of credit into the market for non-normative lifestyles has the effect of obscuring these differences and making all gays and lesbians appear equally affluent as long as the consumer credit market was willing to price all risk permutations and as long as all could enjoy the benefits of immediate consumption, it was possible to believe that class, race, and gender differences no longer mattered. For credit brokers and cultural commentators alike, the rapid expansion of securitized credit appeared to affirm the infinite fungibility of identity markers and the perfect liquidity of risk pro profiles. The creation of the gay market had a tangible impact on the kinds of activism that arose after the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. As advertisers and consumer bankers and mortgage brokers seized upon the gay market as a source of untapped potential, much of the post-AIDS coalition to unleash power, act up, wave of activism refashioned itself in the image offered up by market demographics. With its performative reiteration of consumer spaces and semiotics, queer nations celebrated the liquefaction, or liquefaction of identity in much the same way as the securitized consumer credit market aff affirmed the liquidity of diverse risk profiles and the prof profitability of the non-standard risk. Indeed, 1990s queer theory itself appears in retrospect to be suffused with the spirit of securitized credit market markets. While much of this theoretical work, certainly Butler's gender trouble, was intended as a polemic against the residual biological essentialism of second wave feminism, it was more commonly misread as a negation of actual inequalities and a utopian celebration of the willful mutability of identities. <clears throat> This utopianism had clear parallels in the literature on consumer finance. One of the more respectable celebrants of the consumer finance boom, the Princeton economist Robert Schiller, suggested that new techniques of credit risk scoring combined with securitization had now made it possible to price and therefore hedge against any credit risk, including the most exotic or non-normative. Borrower risks that in the past would have been considered too unsafe to be insured against can now be indefinitely deflected through the alternative means of credit derivatives. Uninsurable or in statistical terms non-normalizable risks could be hedged in a process that was proliferative or fractalizing rather than normative, thus opening up unheard of credit opportunities for the non-traditional borrower. It was precisely such a vision of democratic inclusion beyond the norm that was celebrated by queer nation and its affinity groups. If Clinton's legislative record on gay rights was ambiguous at best, presiding as he had over the don't ask, don't tell policy and the passage of the Defense of Marriage Act, he nevertheless ushered in a consumer credit boom that was more than willing to recognize the value of non-normative lifestyles. As Queer Nation rightly insisted, its politics of performative consumerism was not about assimilation, but rather the credit enabled investment in multiple lifestyle possibilities beyond the norm. Many commentators have noted the strange ambivalence of Queer Nation politics, the fact that it declared itself inassimilable within the profit motive while simultaneously confining its activism to the space of, cons of consumption, the fact that it celebrated the absolute liquidity of identity markers while relentlessly privileging white gay men. Above all, the fact that its spectacular performance of the non-normative gave way so rapidly to the most sober kinds of respectability politics. Yet it is hardly coincidental that the legal recognition of family became an explicit and overwhelming preoccupation of gay activism during this period. <clears throat> 
or that a performative activism held afloat by the dynamics of credit expansion should morph so quickly into a politics of marriage. The expansion of consumer credit did indeed cater to lifestyles and risk markets beyond the norm, <clears throat> seeming to banish the crude forms of invisibility that had reigned in the past by the process of asset accumulation with which it was necessarily allied in the forms of collateral that it inevitably demanded exerted an equally powerful stimulus to discipline oneself within the legal framework of inheritance. The paradoxical relationship between collateral and credit is one that helps to illuminate the continued gravitational pull of the referent within the semiotics of performa performativity. If this relationship can be forgotten at the moment of greatest market euphoria, when all borrowers can enter the market with minimal or no collateral, it violently reasserts itself in periods of debt deflation, when creditors call in their debts and demand the immediate materialization of assets. As soon as asset prices start plummeting, creditors start looking for some kind of fundamental value with which to take stock of their positions and recommence the process of accumulation. Property valuations are reassessed, usually downward. Bad risks are liquidated and ownership rights are clarified. If the relationship between the foundational value of collateral and the aspirational promise of credit can seem tenuous, even infinitely elastic, in the throes of asset appreciation it appears as slavishly referential when the bubble deflates, tethering credit back to the mooring points of real values and stable ownership rights. At stake here, however, is not so much a return to underlying fundamentals, as if the value of assets could be reliably ascertained outside the co the context of appreciating or depreciating expectations as a positive reassertion of foundation on new and suitably purified terms. This dynamic helps to explain why the borrowers who survived the credit who survived uh, survived uh, the credit crunch were those who are already held secure collateral in the form of actual housing assets, not those who entered the market late in the game relying on unpredictable wages to claim the virtual wealth of a mortgaged house, and why the housing boom ended up exacerbating the maldistribution of wealth rather than diminishing it. If expanding credit at first seemed to free borrowers from the tyranny of family wealth, in the last instance it ended up reinforcing it, especially for those at the lower end of the income and wealth scale. It is hardly surprising, then, that the demand for recognition of same-sex marriage, along with its legal forms of property transmission, asserted itself at the precise moment when queers were being welcomed into the market for consumer credit. How long, after all, can one sustain a lifestyle on credit without some long-term accumulation of wealth sufficient to provide collateral? And what use is the accumulation of wealth without some assurance that it will not be expropriated by strangers? If Butler could argue, in the wake of the AIDS crisis, that gay men as a class were defined by their exclusion from the family as the legal form of property transmission, these same, men, these same men were now loudly demanding the recognition of their relationships as legitimate units of reproduction and inheritance. The question of legitimate reproduction and inheritance more generally has been central to campaigns in favor of same-sex marriage. Not only has the jurisprudence of same-sex marriage revived the old, discredited distinction between legitimate and illegitimate children, effectively reiterating the revival of such distinctions in recent welfare ref reform, it has also placed the question of property transmission at the heart of its appeals for legal recognition. As legal scholars have long noted, inheritance, particularly when it is enacted without the validation of a will, remains doggedly attached to, tradi to traditional notions of the family and will almost invariably privilege legally recognized forms of kinship over partners of choice or affection. If queer wealth holders are to secure some form of legal right to bequeath their assets, their relationships need to be validated as family-like and endowed with the same degree of legitimacy as heterosexual marriage. It is far from coincidental, then, that when the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, was finally overturned, it was in a case involving the unequal effects of the estate tax on gay and lesbian couples. As we have seen, the estate tax is only likely to affect the wealthiest of, co the wealthiest of couples,
and has no impact at all on the vast majority of gay and lesbian relationships. And yet the expansion of consumer credit has so thoroughly generalized the aspirational investment in inherited wealth that estate tax reform is increasingly popular among a wide swath of gay and lesbian voters and has in recent years become central to efforts by the human rights campaign and other advocacy groups to redefine non-normative citizens as legitimate credit risks and bearers of wealth. Here we can see how the legal recognition of non-normative relationships demands the literal reinvention of tradition, that is, the inclusion of once criminalized relationships within the ambit of legitimate reproduction. By any standard, the terrain traversed by queer politics over the last three decades has been extreme, moving as it has from the radical anti-normativity of ACT UP and Queer Nation to the reproductive legitimacy of the same-sex marriage campaign. We live in an era where normativity itself no longer appears to play the overwhelmingly exclusionary and hence central role it once did in the, rela- in the regulation of sexuality in the mid to late 20th century, despite its prominence as a concept in contemporary queer studies. The fact of non-normative sexuality is no longer defined as criminal or pathological by the social sciences, nor is it likely to trigger a whole series of medical and psychiatric interventions on the part of the welfare state and its allied institutions, although these older forms of social stigmatization are now being rapidly replaced by new kinds of religiously inflected moral exclusion. We live at a time where the public affirmation of one's status as a homosexual will no longer automatically exclude a person from employment, credit, or housing, which is not to say that homophobia no longer exists. Far from it. In the spirit of Foucault's periodization of power, in fact, we might classify this period as post-normative. If we take normativity to refer to the precise forms of statistical exclusion that accompanied and shaped the Fordist family wage, along with their epistemological expression in the biological, psychological, and social sciences, where different kinds of sexuality were once overwhelmingly defined in terms of pathological deviance. In this sense, perhaps Foucault was right to see the advent of neoliberalism as marked, as marking the passage toward a post-normative formation of power, where we find an optimization of systems of difference, rather than their subordination to the norm. But this is also an era in which relationships of any kind are increasingly required to justify themselves within the framework of legitimate reproduction. In many but not all social contexts, non-normative sexuality is, is now much more likely to be accepted, as long as the attendant transmission of biological and economic assets, that is, children and wealth, is appropriately legitimated within the form of marriage. The socially meaningful dividing line, in other words, appears to have shifted from the normative and non-normative expression of sexuality to the legitimate or illegitimate relationship, as legally validated marriage fast becomes a prerequisite for the recognition of minimal social rights. At the same time, the most virulent new forms of homophobia are increasingly turning to the language of moral, divine law, rather than social scientific normativity to contest the public expression of non-heterosexual desire, an issue we will return to in chapter 7. Here again, it is a question of legitimacy and its sources, divine or secular, rather than the distribution of norms. Perhaps then we need to question the continuing prominence of the term normativity within contemporary discussions of sexual politics. What is at stake in debates around same-sex marriage, after all, is not so much homonormativity as homo legitimacy, a demand for inclusion that is at once radically anti normative and relentlessly traditionalist, and on the opposing side, not so much heteronormativity as a vision of morality grounded in the theological language of natural law. <laughs>